Romans 14, we're going to begin reading verse number 11. The Bible says, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another any more. But judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I do thank you again for the opportunity to stand and preach your word. Lord, I do pray that uh, you'd hedge my mind now, that uh, you protect my thoughts. Lord, I pray that you bring back to my remembrance those things that I've studied. Lord, I pray that you'd help your people today from this unworthy vessel. Lord, I pray that you'd magnify your son. Lord, I pray that he'd draw all men unto him. And Lord, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, in these, really for the past two chapters of the book of Romans... The Apostle Paul has been dealing with Christian living. Okay, he's, he's not necessarily dealing with salvation anymore. He's not dealing with sin. He's not dealing with. He's talking about how we ought to possess our vessels in honor and how to live a life that is pleasing unto God. And by the time we get down to verse number 11, it says, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, every tongue shall confess to God. The first thing I want you to notice by way of introduction is an appointment. In this verse, we see that every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess to God. Whether you realize it or not today, there is a time in your future. Maybe your near future. It may be millions of years from now. Don't know when it is, but at some point, we're going to leave this earth and then after that point, you're going to have to stand before a thrice holy God in judgment. And what does the word every mean? Without exception. But what's without exception mean? All. You know what the definition of all is? All. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess to God. From the book of Revelation, we find out what they're going to confess unto God. That He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. There's an appointment not where all will stand before him at once. No, you individually will see. In fact, we can go book of Revelation find out he throws away heaven and earth by this point. He gets rid of the stars and space. You are standing on nothing but God's power before a holy God and you'll have to bow the knee and confess unto him that he is who he said that he was. And just to show you how serious God was when it came to that promise, the beginning of the verse says, as I live. So in other words, God says, as long as I'm still around, this will still be true. You can't get rid of a God that spoke everything into existence. You can't get rid of a God that even though you may want to write him out of a textbook, you may want to write him out of today's you know, society beliefs or the education system, you can't get rid of the God that said, let there be light, and then there was light. It's only by His grace and His mercy that He hadn't wiped us all off the face of the earth anyway. But there is an appointment. Not just an appointment, it's appointed unto men once to die, the Bible says, but after that, the judgment. You've got an appointment with God today. And I promise you, that's one appointment you're not going to miss. But second, verse number 12, I want you to notice the accounting. So then every one of us, again, there's that word every, shall give an account of himself to God. There's an account that's going to happen one day. Everything you've ever done, everything you've ever said, everything you've ever thought, everything that you've ever desired in your heart, every action, every inaction, everything that you thought you should do and everything that you didn't do, you're going to have to stand before God and give an account of those deeds. Now, if you're here this morning lost, you're not going to give an account of the deeds that you did in your body, whether they were good or evil. You're not going to stand before God and He's going to weigh your good and your bad, and if there's more good than bad, you're going to make it into heaven. No, if you stand before God lost, you're going to give an account for why you rejected His only begotten Son. You're going to give an account for the sin of unbelief upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then you're going to have to answer why you didn't believe. That's what an account means. It's not an audit. An audit's where you find things that are wrong. 
giving an account is where you have to give the reasoning behind what you did. See, some people don't get too frightened by the fact that, well, I'm going to have to stay in and God's going to tell me all the things I did wrong. No, 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 no. God already knows what you did wrong. You already know what you did wrong. When you stand before God, you have to give an account unto God of why you did what you did. You're going to have to stand before God all those times that you didn't love God the way that you were supposed to. And you're going to have to look into those eyes that are as flames of fire. And you're going to have to tell Him, even though you loved me more than I know what love is, here's why I didn't love you. People don't like to think about that, Brother Ron. You're going to have to give an account or you're going to have to explain all the times that you disobeyed His commandments. You're going to have to stand before God and give an account of why you didn't have the compassion for others that God said you were supposed to have. You're going to have to stand before God and explain to Him why you thought your desires were more important than the desires of God. And you're not going to have to give an account to somebody that looks like me Oh no, the Bible says in Revelation that the heaven and earth fled away from his face. His face is so powerful, his visage so commanding, that even heaven and earth couldn't stay around when he revealed himself. And you're going to have to stand before that God and look into that face and explain why you lived the way that you lived. But then, verse number 13, there's also a adjudication or a judging. See, verse 13 says, Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. He said, Let us not judge. Why? Because there is a judge already. His name's Jesus. In fact, your Bible says that all judgment has been committed unto him. That means that there's one authority on whether something's right or whether it's wrong. There's only one person you've got to worry about giving that account to, and his name is Jesus, the Son of God, the Prince of Peace, Emmanuel, all the different names that he has in your Bible. It's still true. Jesus is the judge, not us. The adjudication that's going to happen, it's not according to me. There are a lot of people that live a life that's more spiritual than Brother Jordan. There's a lot of people that live a life where they do more charity than Brother Jordan. There's a lot of people, I'm sure, that pray more than Brother Jordan. And a lot of people that study more than Brother Jordan. But you're not giving an account unto me. I'm not the one doing the judging. You're not even going to be judged by your standards. You're going to be judged according to the standards of Jesus. And if you want to find out how Jesus likes to judge things, you can go read the Gospels. And you'll find that every time somebody asked a question unto Jesus, he would say, it is written. Or you'd go and you'd find that Jesus would say, well, the Father says, or I've come to do the Father's will. You start studying about Jesus, and you know what you're going to find? He fulfilled every jot and tittle of this book to prove that he was the Son of God. You want to know how Jesus decides things, how Jesus will judge the world by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. But keeping all that in mind, let's go back to verse number 11. It says, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. You don't have to give an account for what the church did. This morning, you're not going to give an account of what I did. That'd be unfair. God is a just God. I don't have to explain why people do the wicked things that go on in this world. The things that confuse me. The things that don't... I don't understand how somebody, other than being demon-possessed, could go out and buy a firearm and pre-plan that they would go and attack innocent children at a school. That baff, I, I cannot comprehend that. I cannot comprehend somebody that hates another group of people so much that they would strap explosives to themselves or a vehicle and drive it into a crowded area and detonate it. I don't understand that. My God didn't ask me to die for him. He asked me to live for him. 
I don't understand certain things about this world, but I do understand me. I live with me 24-7. I can't get away from me, if I'm honest, Brother Tommy. On the days that I want to, just because I don't look in the mirror doesn't mean I can get away from him. I'm stuck with me. But I do understand me. Do I know everything about me? No. God does. He knows every kind of every hair on my head. He knows my very thoughts. He knows the intents of my heart, which according to the Bible says no man can know the heart. God knows everything about because He made me. So God knows me better than I know myself. And I'm going to have to give an account unto the one that knows me better than I know myself. So when I stand before God, I can't say, well, Lord, you didn't give me the ability to do this. He knows that he did. I can't stand before God and say, well, Lord, I just didn't have the same amount of faith that that person that you gave unto them. According to the Bible, it gave unto every man a measure of faith. That means everybody got the same we're talking about a God that according to your Bible is no respecter of persons. That means if he did it for somebody else, he could do it for you. And if he did do it for somebody else and he's able to do it for you, that means I'm the reason it didn't happen. Because if God's the same, and if he's able, why doesn't it happen? Because someone got in the way. It's usually you. Usually me. But what are you saying, Brother George? I'm not just giving an account to somebody where I'm trying to... Con it's not like a courtroom that we have nowadays. Or even a courtroom that's ever been. Where you have to convince somebody that nowadays it's a jury of your peers. The judge isn't the one that's deciding whether or not you're guilty when it comes to crime nowadays. It's a jury of your peers. You've got to convince, depending on what, how big of a problem you got, it could be six, it could be nine, it could be twelve in the state of Kentucky jurors people that are just like you jury of your peers now brother Josh back in the day I did all that public speaking I can be very convincing when I want to be I may be able to fool you but see I'm not presenting this to a jury when I stand before God no I'm presenting this to the one that made me the one who knew me before he formed me in the belly the one who saw me through the scope of time and loved me with an everlasting love. That's the one that I have to stand before and give an account to. So with that in mind this morning, I just want to preach on for a little bit. What's your excuse? What are you going to say to God when you have to stand before Him? I mean, our dear friend, Brother Greg Phillips, he's got a saying that gets a little misquoted every now and then around here that says excuses are just lies wrapped, or words wrapped around a lie. You can spin the tail however long you want to. You can take that yarn and try and turn it into something beautiful and extravagant, but just because you keep wrapping something around it doesn't change what's on the inside. A lie. Either something's true or it's not. Either you did it or you didn't. An excuse is trying to justify why you didn't do the right thing. But if it was wrong, it doesn't matter why you did it. It's still wrong. So when you stand before God and have to give an account of yourself to the one that made you, what's your excuse going to be? First off, what's your excuse going to be for ruling your own life? What's your excuse going to be for not letting Jesus be the Lord of your life? I mean, look with me in verse number 11 again. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess to God. We already said it, that what? He's the King of kings and Lord of all lords. I don't care if you're saved or you're lost in here this morning, you know that there's a God. And you know that that God is stronger than you are, more powerful than you are, wiser than you are. That that God is from everlasting to everlasting. You may think that you're all that, but deep down in the gable end of your soul, your soul knows that God breathed into you the breath of life. Amen. That we are the creation, not the creator. So knowing that, what's your excuse in not giving your life over to the one that isn't a dictator? He's not standing up there on a mountainside somewhere waiting to strike you down with lightning bolts. 
No. We've already said he loved you with an everlasting love. John 3, read the whole chapter of John 3. God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world, but to save the world. That he loved you so much that he sent his only begotten son to die for your sins. Right. Before that you ever knew about him, before you had even recognized that there was a problem in your life, that God has orchestrated all the events in your life that today you would be here in a church service hearing about a God that does love you and a God that does want the best for you and a God that wants you to be able to stand before Him and He can say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. But if we don't change things, what's your excuse going to be? If you're lost in your sins this morning, what's your excuse going to be when you stand before God and He says on this date, at this time, you heard that you had a need for a Savior. And that Jesus was born of a virgin. That he lived 33 and a half some years of perfect sinless life. Then he became our sacrificial lamb and shed his blood on Calvary. Three days later he got up out the grave and he's forever seated at the right hand of God all so that you could be forgiven of your sins. Amen. What's your excuse going to be for not believing in him? But if you're here today and you're saved, what's your excuse for not making Him Lord of your life? He's Savior. Everybody's okay with Jesus being Savior. That means that Jesus does for me what I can't do for myself, Brother Phil. Everybody likes getting something. Nobody likes giving anything. Although the Bible tells us that more blessed to give than to receive. Can you imagine that as great as being saved feels, Brother Phil? And it feels great. Can you wrap your head around the idea that when you give your life over to God, like Brother Josh said not too long ago, being saved is the best thing in the world. But being saved and being in the perfect will of God, that's the best life you can ever have. You're fine with Him saving you. You're just not fine with Him making the decisions for you. What's your excuse going to be? You really think God's going to care that this TV show was on? You really think God's going to care that after you had a bad day at work, you didn't feel like doing something for God? The Bible says he was tempted in all points like we are, yet was he without sin. He also promised that greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Why do you think the Bible says that we are more than conquerors through Christ? I'm not a conqueror, but he already conquered it, and he can do for me what he's already done before. We are able to overcome, we just choose not to. We're able. I mean, turn back two chapters. Chapter number 12, end of the chapter. Verse number 21. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. You are able to overcome the evil of the world with the good that God has birthed in you. So what's your excuse for not doing it? Can we all agree that if it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander? Does not the Bible say a little leaven, leaven it the whole lump? So if we know that it's expected, what's your excuse for thinking it doesn't apply to you? What's your excuse for thinking only the pastor has to do certain things? Or that only teachers have to do certain things? Or only those that are in charge of visitation? Or those that, you know, want to have ladies meeting? Those that do this? Those that do... What's your excuse for excluding yourself? from one of those that bows the knee on this side of death and confesses with the mouth, Lord, you're the Lord of my life. I give it everything unto you without reservation. Everything that I have, surrendering, surrendering yourself to God. Because that's what he expected. The Apostle Paul who wrote the book of Romans also wrote, you've been bought with a price. Your life is no longer your own. And that's a good thing. The Bible says, for the, if the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. But He says you've been bought with a price. He's not saying you're His slave. He's saying He paid the price for you to be free. But He also tells you how to use that freedom. Because we are free moral agents. I cannot make anybody else do anything that they don't want to do. 
God will not force you to do something that you don't want to do. But God gives you the choice. He'll tell you to go that way is life, but to go this way is death. And He'll give you the tools that you need to make sure that you're staying in the light rather than in darkness. He'll equip you. He'll give you everything that you need. You just have to desire to do it. Desire to follow after Him. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Where are we looking unto Him? At the throne. Where He's seated in heaven. To look unto Jesus is to admit that He's better than us. He is the Lord. He's not just our Savior. He's the King of all glory. Sure. To look unto Him is to admit that I have to... You can't look up unless you realize you're down. Until you admit that you're lower than where you think, where your flesh wants to think that you are. Until you admit that maybe you're not all that you think that you might be cracked up to be. Until you say, Lord, I need. Doesn't matter what comes after that. We are a needy people. Lord, I need you is what it comes down to. When you get to that point, then you'll look unto Him. Because you can look to the left and the right and in front of you and behind you. You're not going to find him there. Because he's up. He's above where we are. So what's your excuse for not looking unto him and admitting, Lord, I am yours? But second, what's your excuse going to be for rebelling against his commandments? Look with me. Just a few verses. Chapter number 14. Look a few up. Okay, verse number one, it's talking about receive the weak in faith. Verse number two, for one believes that he may eat, the other believes that he may not eat. That's talking about things that people thought were unclean to eat back in the day. People still do that to this day. That's why they have that thing that's called, well, is this kosher? That means is it clean in Hebrew? Uh, the Apostle Paul said that God said it's okay for you to eat whatever you want to. But if some people are so weak in faith that they think, I, I can't eat that. That's fine. Let them believe whatever they want to believe. Okay, but if we go back one more chapter, that's something that we would nowadays call conviction. Okay? But if we go to chapter number 13, if we go down verse number 9, it says, For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not, bear, shall not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You want to know what God's commandment is? Because Jesus said that, we said it in Sunday school this morning, if you love him, you'll keep his commandments. You want to know why the people don't keep the commandments of God? Because they don't have the right kind of love. They love them enough to come to church, but they don't love enough to live for them. I've said it for years, if you love right, you live right. Because perfect love casteth out all fear. There are a lot of people that are afraid that they can't be what God expects them to be. God already promised that He'd help you become what you need to be. Don't worry about that. Perfect love takes care of all them questions and all them doubts. It casts out fear, and it's replaced with faith. Because I love him, I believe he's enough to do what he promised he would do. But what's your excuse going to be? I mean, we've read a few of them. I doubt, hopefully, nobody in here has killed anybody this week. Okay? If you have, I've got somebody I'd like you to talk to. His name is Deputy Foster of the Boone County Sheriff's Department. Okay, we can arrange that meeting very quickly. Okay? I doubt that anybody went out and robbed a bank like we said this morning in Sunday school this week. If you did, why are you here laying low? Okay, we ain't going to help you. If they come for you, hey, right there, that's where they're at. Didn't know he did it. Not our fault. Right, but, goes on to say, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. You know what that comes down to? Lying. When was the last time you told a lie? Because if you loved God enough, you wouldn't have. 
You say, well, Brother Jordan, is there a way that I have to love? No, you just have to love him more than you love everything else. That's what he deserves. We already, he's the Lord of your life. He should be first. The Bible says anything less than God having the best in your life is iniquity. And if you regard iniquity in your heart, God won't even hear your prayers. If you loved God, you'd keep iniquity from forming between you and God. Amen. I'm not saying you don't love Him. I'm just saying you need to love Him more. You know how I can say that? Because we ought to love God the same way God loved us. And you know how God loved you? We've already said He loved you with an everlasting love. But the Bible says that God is love. Until everything that you are is devoted to loving God, you haven't met the mark yet. Because everything that God is is love, and He chose to love you. So that's the kind of love that you should desire to have for the God that loved you. If you love God with everything you are, you won't lie. And I know we're not perfect. We're never going to reach that state in this sin-cursed flesh that we're stuck with. We were conceived in sin. We were born in sin. We were sinners by choice, by nature, and by practice. We was as sinful as you could be. Everything that we were was sin. But God saved your soul. And He gave you the tools to live in this flesh, but to use it to God's glory. But until I've got a body like His, I won't be able to love God like God deserves. I can always love Him more. But I understand that I'm going to fall short of Him. But if you've got a love and a desire to live for God because you love the one that redeemed your never-dying soul, because you have a love for the one that did for you what nobody else could have done for you, what you couldn't even have done for yourself, if you have a love for the one that is altogether lovely, for the one that said, taste and see that the Lord is good, the one that the psalmist said, daily he loadeth us with benefits, the one who bestows upon us grace and mercy. Those are holy things of God that we have no claim to, but God loves us so much He gives them to us anyway. If you're a parent, every time you look in the face of your child and you're thankful for it, you ought to have a desire and a love to show God how thankful for you are that He gave them to you. When you look at your life and you see everything that shouldn't be because we know how little and how mundane we are, and we sit there and we scratch our heads, how in the world do we have it this good? It's because of God. By the grace of God, I am what I am. Right. And by the grace of God, I'm not what I'm not too. Amen. Everything that I'm not and I'm proud that I'm not, it's because God's grace has done a work in my life. Amen. How could you not love that God? Right. See, some of us are appreciative, but we don't show that outward expression of love. If love's really in your heart, whatever's in your heart works its way out. You may be able to fool somebody for a while, but eventually what's in your heart is coming out. Amen. It's coming out through your mouth, or it's coming out through the way that you walk and live your life. The Bible says we're written epistles known and read of all men. Those that see on a day-to-day -day basis when you're not all dressed up and you don't have your best on and you haven't sprayed yourself with cologne and like Brother Brian, you forgot to put deodorant on before you left the house that day, maybe a little bit stinky, but on the days that you forgot to shave or you ran out of time to shave and you walk out looking like you're about half dead because you had to work a double the day before and you got about two hours of sleep, on those days, if the love of God's in your heart, it doesn't matter what's happened in your life. You're still going to live as unto the Lord. Because the first thought on your head when you wake up in the morning isn't, well, what do I have to do today? The first thought on your mind is, the Lord gave me another day to live. Sure. Today is the day that the Lord hath made. Yeah. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Right. First thought is, Lord, thank you for another day. Amen. Your second thought is, Lord, thank you for those that, my family members, my loved ones that are still here with me. Right. Your third thought is, Lord, what you want me to do today? What do we have to address in the closet? in the prayer closet. What do we have to address in study? Why do you think David said, early will I seek thee? Amen. Lord, let's get it out of the way. Lord, what do I need for today so that I can go out and live a life that's right with you, but also that is a light of you? 
His commandments were that if you love him, you'll keep his commandments. And if you love him, the commandments are not burdensome. Amen. I mean, we said it in Sunday school, I'll say it again, but Donald, it wasn't hard for me. I didn't have to struggle with this week to not go out and rob people. Not by anything that I've done. God just took that. I don't have that desire. I know if I went out and robbed, I'd not be right with God. I'd rather be right with God than robbing people. I didn't go out, and now I can't say that I didn't want to, Brother Josh, but I didn't shoot nobody this week. Okay? Every now and then there's somebody that crawls up under my skin and in the flesh. I don't, I don't want to kill them. I just want to like take off a pinky toe or something. They don't need it, but it would teach them a lesson. Like, don't cut people off in traffic. That would solve it. If you just take one pinky toe, everybody's good. They all, like, hey, I remember I'm not going to do it no more. Okay, not saying that's the right way to do it. I'm just saying I think it'd be effective, okay? But I didn't go out and murder nobody this week. Didn't even have a desire to. Right? Well, there's some people that if they don't read their Bible, they get convicted over it. See, people that can do things that are against what God said and then it doesn't bother them, I worry about those people. See, if you can tell a lie and it don't bother you, one of two things is going on. First one is you lost. Now you say, Brother Jordan, are you saying I'm not saying? No, I'm just saying that's the first option. The second option is, is you're so backslid on God that you can't even feel the presence of the Holy Ghost in your life anymore. You've grieved the Holy Ghost out of your life. Both of those are scary situations. If you can go out and live the way that you want to in the flesh and God doesn't bother you about it, you're either so far in a far country that you're going to have to come to yourself and get back to the Father's house or you've never been made a member of the family of God. Because the Bible says and God promised that if you was one of His, you'd be chastised for doing wrong. He promised that He chastens those that He loves. He promised that He wouldn't leave you where you ought not to be. Now sometimes He corrects us. And the Bible says that some He turns over to the destruction of the flesh that the soul might be saved. Sometimes people live so wicked after they get saved, God will allow them to die so that their flesh doesn't vex and grieve their saved soul any longer. That it hurts the heart of God to see the soul that He birthed and made a new creature suffocated and strangled by sinful living out in the world. So He'll destroy that sinful flesh so that their soul can finally be what God desired it to be. Serious consequences. God's pretty serious about living a life that becometh a Christian. That becomes the name of His only begotten Son. That brings glory and honor to the name that is above every other name, which is Jesus. So what's your excuse going to be? Now, I know that none of us are perfect. None of us got halos. But until you start thinking about everything that you did today, even though you may hate that you did it, sometimes you hate the thing that you did, but you know you're going to do it again anyway. What's your excuse going to be for knowing the difference between right and wrong and choosing wrong? For standing before God and saying, Lord, here's why I didn't love you enough to change the way that I lived. Because His commandments are very clear. In fact, they tell me that the Bible's written on about third or fourth grade reading comprehension level. It's so simple that a child can understand it. I know Thou shalt not commit adultery. You know what that means? Don't do adultery. It's not that complicated. Jesus went one step further. Jesus said if you desire a woman in your heart that you've committed the sin of adultery already. Just because you didn't follow through with it doesn't mean that you didn't want to do it. 
just as guilty as if you did do it. Not according to Brother Jordan, according to Jesus. So knowing that it's not just the act, it's the desire to do it that God considers sinful. Do we look at our life and say, Lord, take them desires from me? Or do you wrestle with them day in and day out? You might not do it, but you're still not living in freedom. Jesus said you're free, free indeed. If you're free, you're not bothered by those desires anymore. You have conquered them in your life. That's what God desires for you. So instead of wrestling it day in and day out, what's your excuse for not just giving it to the Lord and saying, Lord, take it from me. I'm not strong enough to handle this. I'm not wise enough to figure out this situation. And instead of it vexing you day in and day, what's your excuse going to be for not keeping the commandments? Because you know what a command is? One, it's instruction. Two, it's not optional. Okay, but three, it's something that was so important to God, He made sure it was preserved for you to know it. He didn't leave it to chance. It was written and then preserved by God for over 2,000 years at the newest. At the oldest, four or 5,000 years. Just so that you could know what God said specifically to you. You know who God wrote the Bible to? You. He also wrote it to me, but He wrote it to you. You know why God preserved the Word of God? So that you could know what God said. And you know why God wanted you to know what God said so much? And why it was so important to Him? Because unless you knew that you were in need of a Savior, and that a Savior was sent from heaven to earth just to save you, you wouldn't have believed it. He kept a record and gave all the proof that you needed. Now, just because somebody else found it and God gave it to them doesn't mean that He didn't give it to you specifically. Amen. Don't know if you know this. You can open up the very front cover of your Bible and put to your name from God. Because that's what it was. Amen. And every edition you get after that, right, if you this one falls apart on me and I have to go get another, I can still write in that one, to Jordan, from God. And it's still just as true. Yeah. So if God thought that much about His commandments, what's our excuse for not keeping them? Because you're going to have to explain it to Him one day. But number three. What's your excuse going to be for rejecting those who needed you? Look with me in verse number 13. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore. In other words, the way that other people live isn't my business. They may be wrong, but that's between them and God. All I can do is tell them what the Bible says. I can't cast judgment on them. It's not my place to punish somebody else for doing something wrong. That's God's business. The Bible says, you know, a man does not chasten or punish another master's servant. They belong to God, not me. Right, that, there's a whole lesson right there. At least a whole point, but we ain't going to cover it. Maybe a whole message just on that. But what's my, you know, what's your excuse going to be for looking at other people's lives more than looking at yours? Uh, but he says, let us not therefore judge one another anymore. But judge this rather. He's saying, if you want to be judgy, here's what you can be. That no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. In other words, he says, if you want to judge, judge yourself that you haven't put a single stumbling block or an occasion to fall or to trip or to snare somebody's life for anybody in your life. Again, didn't we just read over here in verse number, or chapter number 13 that all the law is fulfilled in this? Right. Well, first off, Jesus said it this way. There are two great commandments. First one, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. That means you keep His commandments. But then, He said, The second is like unto it. Love thy neighbor as thyself. So love God supremely, and love those around you as you 
not would love yourself. No, he's saying love thy neighbor as thyself, meaning I ought to love the way that I have been loved. There's some days I don't love myself, Brother Clint. Some days I can't stand myself. But he's saying love others as you have been loved. Well, who have we been loved by? God. You know the love you ought to show to others? The love that God showed to you. That's the standard. And in chapter 13, we find that all the rest of the law that he didn't mention is summed up as love thy neighbor as thyself. Again, if you love right, you live right. But he says, here is your judgment that you don't put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in your brother's way. Well, who's your brother? Well, there are many ways that the Bible talks about kinship. First one is, could be anybody that was related back to the beginning. If you had the same ancestor, you were brothers, so to speak. You were of the same bloodline. Well, everybody that you come across came from somebody. His name was Adam. You're related to everybody that you come across, whether you realize it or not. And if you don't want to go back that far, you don't even have to go back that far. You can go to Noah. Right? But if you've been saved, guess what? There's another one that you were birthed after. His name was Jesus. And you have brothers and sisters in Christ. So whether they're your neighbor or whether they're your brother, what's the commandment? That you love them the way that God loved you. You know what the world needs? The love of God. You know what people in your life need? You. That's why God allowed them to cross your path. If you believe that God's an, a holy God, an all-knowing God, and an all-powerful God, that means that you believe nothing in your life happens by accident or chance. It happens either because you wanted it to or because God wanted it to. And if somebody crosses your path and it wasn't somebody that you wanted to come across your path, that means God sent them or God allowed it to happen that way. If God allowed them to cross your path, have you ever stopped and thought about what God wants you to give to all the people you come across in a day? If God was done with us after we got saved, He'd take us to heaven. But yet, Sermon on the Mount, if any man have a light, or what man has a light and hides it under a bushel? He instructed us to be the salt of the earth. The light of the world. Salt preserves things. It keeps them from going bad sooner. You know what your purpose in life is? To keep those that are on their way to hell from dying and going to hell sooner. Right. Why? So that maybe they see the light that's shining out of your life. And they come to the realization that in their darkness, God just shines a little light. And it dawns on them that they're in need of a Savior that they need to get out of where they're at and they can't do it on their own. And you know what the instrument that God uses to do that? People. You. Don't care how old or how young. Don't care how busy or how lazy. Don't care how introverted or extroverted you are. Jesus promised that He would use anyone. That if any man come unto Him, He'd no wise cast them out. You think, well, I can't do for God. You can do a whole lot more for God than you think you can. Because I know that God can do a whole lot with a real little. And I'm a whole, like the lowest, the least amount that anybody has. And I've seen what He can do for me. I look around at other people and I, I tend to think that other people, right, I esteem them better than myself. Probably because I don't know them as well as I know myself. But I know what I am. And I just have a tendency to think of others as better. They deserve respect. Because you know what? Everybody deserves respect. They deserve to be talked to like a friend and not an enemy. Even if they're not my friend. The Bible says if you want friends, you must show yourself friendly. At work, people know if they need a laugh, come over. I'll say something sarcastic. Right? It may not be what they wanted to hear, but it'll get them laughing. Right? People know 
that if they need something done on the job and not like, well, I'll get to it when I get to it, they call me. Now, why they call me? Well, I know why they call me, but I wish that they wouldn't call me because I'm busy enough already. But people know if you call Jordan, it's going to get done. Right? Not next week, not two days from now. It, I'm going to get on it now, and if it can be done, it will be done. If it can't be done right now, I'm going to let you know why it can't, and I'll let you know when it will be done. Because I take people's time seriously. Their time's valuable. Right? My time, whether I realize it or not, is valuable. So we walk around and we judge people. There's that word again. Well, who's that person? Right? Who in the world would want to go and tell that person? That guy cut me off in traffic. It's real hard to love people when they cut you off in traffic. It's real hard to love the guy that turns the wrong way into the roundabout and then sits there like he's, you know, angry at me. That happened one time on the way to church. Almost horn cussed the guy. He put it in reverse and decided to try it again. But crazy things. It's, you, you only have to turn one direction. You go right, and then you choose right again when you want to get off. It's that easy. If I can understand that, how come they can't? Anyway. Now, even when it's hard to treat others the way that you would expect to be treated. Right? There's a greater understanding behind the veil, so to speak, that we've already said it, your life is a written epistle known and read of all men. Either your life testifies to the fact that God is able to do what He promised to do, and that God's people are the way that God said they should be, or your life is a testimony to the fact that everything that those Baptists say, everything that newborn believers spout, it's all just hip uh, hypocrisy. It's not real. They put on a show. They're all two-faced and phony. And whether you realize it or not, the way you live your life impacts how other people can reach people in their life. There are people that need you. That's why God left you here. Amen. There are things that only you can do for God and people that only you can reach for God that even if God took you out of here, nobody else could reach that person. That's why He left you. So what's your excuse going to be when you stand before God? And he says, how come you didn't reach that person? They offended me one time. Who cares? Really, who cares? Now that person made me angry once. They're dying and going on their way to hell. Or that person said something one time in church that I didn't agree with. Who cares? They're stumbling under a heavy load. It's not my job to judge other people. It's my job to do for others what Christ did for me. Amen. What's your excuse going to be for being a stumbling block? That word it should be pretty easy to understand. It's something that people step on and they stumble. Okay, It doesn't have to be something that you trip over. It could be like one of them, you know, like when they had the old fun houses back in the day and the floor would like tilt on you and everything. Hated hey, them stupid things. Right? Your life could be so unstable that when somebody goes to step on you, they break an ankle. Doesn't have to be something that they trip over. Could be something that just causes them harm. It says, or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. You may think, well, I'm just going to lay down here, stay out of the way. But you laying down may be what it causes somebody else to fall. Maybe because you laid down, their load got too heavy. And they fell under the weight. Well, the Bible says God will not put on us more than we're able to bear. True. But if you left your load by the side of the road and somebody else tries to pick it up, they may fall under the weight. I don't know about you, sometimes I put on to myself more than I'm able to bear. God didn't do it, I did it. But the Bible says that if I see someone 
a brother, that I ought to desire to bear one another's burdens. Why? Because it so fulfills the law of Christ. You want to know why I ought to desire to help people? Because God reveals unto me what He sees in them. And you know what's in them that needs help? The same thing that was in me. When I look at others, I see where I used to be. Or I see where I could have been. Or I see what my life could have turned out like if God hadn't intervened. Or I see where I may be in a few years. I see someone who's at the end of their life. And they're under a heavy load. And instead of looking on them like, ah, well, their family will take care of them. I, don't, I really don't have the time. It's inconvenient. Now, I see someone that deserves a little bit of rest because they've run a race to the best of their ability. I see someone that should be esteemed for their life in the Lord. An elder, as the Bible would call them. Someone to learn from. They may not be able to go anymore, but they sure have seen a lot. And they've conquered, or they've been through some of life's worst journeys. And just because I want to be good to that person. Why? Because I see in them what I desire to accomplish. And I want to be good to God's people. So those that you could reach, what's your excuse going to be? When they have to stand before God and give an account of their life and God turns to you and says, well, why didn't you go? What's the answer going to be? To be honest with you, I could ask a whole bunch of questions today. Truth is, no matter which answer you give, it's not going to be good enough. The truth is that regardless of whatever it is that you think is going to stand up before God, there's only one thing that He accepts, and it's holiness. It's His Son, Jesus Christ. That's what He finds acceptable. And you know what I've learned? I can't be Christ on my own. But He did promise that He drove me in His righteousness. He did promise that He'd be the friend that never leaveth nor forsaketh. He did promise that regardless of what happens, He'll no wise cast me out. He promised that if I confess my sins, He's faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me. And He also promised that each and every day was a new opportunity to go out and do the will of God. I can't change yesterday, but today is a new day. If tomorrow comes by the grace of God, tomorrow is a brand new day to live up to God's expectations. And He promised that He wouldn't let me go and try and do it alone. That He'd be there every step of the way. The promise is today, not only as He lives, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. The promise today also is, is that everyone that asks of the Lord shall receive. If you seek, you'll find and if you knock, it'll be open unto you. So long as you don't ask to consume it upon your own lust. It means if you've got a pure desire to live for God and you ask Him to help you, He will. And if He did it for somebody else, He already said He'll do it for you. He wouldn't promise to do it if He didn't have the power to deliver. So when you think of, well, what am I going to say before God? I'd like to stand before Him and say, well, Lord... Up till this point, I have no excuses. But after that day, I did my best. That's all that God expects from you is your best. You know what your best is? All that you can do. And not anything that you couldn't do. He doesn't expect you to do more than you're able. He doesn't expect you to do unreasonable or unthinkable things. In fact, he said obedience is better than sacrifice. He said, trust and obey. That through faith, you could live the life that God desired for you to live. But if we don't, we'll have to stand before Him one day. Can't get around that. Doesn't matter where you're going to spend eternity, heaven or new heaven and new earth or the lake of fire, 
you'll have to stand before God and give an account. So what's your answer going to be? Brother Josh? Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.